on this beautiful Sunday morning. second i'm so glad so glad that you guys are here worshiping with us that's awesome if you're a guest my name's mitch i'm the pastor here and just we're honored we're honored that you came to our church this morning and that you're here if you want to know more about the church we send out an email every week we, do, we try to minimize the announcements and the things we say up here so we can get to the most important thing and that is worshiping jesus so uh, we try to minimize that, but there's a lot of things happening in our church and church family. If you want to know about that or you want to know more information, you want to get in touch with us, we'd love for you to fill out a Connect card. And you can take that to the Welcome Center right after the services, and, and we have a little packet for you. It's kind of a welcome packet that kind of tells you a little bit about the church, and, and we just would love to connect with you in any way. If you're also, if you're a guest today, please don't feel any obligation to participate in the offering. We think that's a very important part of our Christian walk is offerings to the Lord. Uh, but if you're a first-time guest today, please don't feel any obligation to participate in that. For the rest of you, we hope that you'll invest tangibly in what God is doing <laughs> in, uh, in the work of the Lord for this summer and so grateful. Thank you for those of you who are online watching. We're so grateful that you are online 
And uh, we have Marilyn Boucher, who is in Virginia, and she's actually our online host right now. So if you have any questions, you're online, you can talk to her, and she will help you and guide you in any way. But we would love to connect with you guys who are online as well. Hey, we've got several things that are happening. I know that Michelle Rowan, I see Michelle in the audience over there, that she is started a women's Bible study that started recently. And uh, they have like 25 or 30 women involved in this thing. It's packed out. And we have another one starting in June, on June 28th. So just coming up, June 28th. That one's led by Diana Holstein. And Diana and her husband, Jim, I had the opportunity to go through Rooted with them. And let me tell you, they are fantastic. And Diana's starting this Bible study for ladies. And she is a rock star. She's a life coach. She is, man, she's a deep rooted woman of faith and uh, that'll be a great if you missed the bible study with michelle or you want a double dose uh, you can come to her bible study at six thirty. now men don't feel left out we're we've got some things that we're working on we're putting the pieces to the puzzle together for some great men's things and we're going to kind of revamp some of what we're doing with men's ministry and that'll be coming probably i think i think we're working on mid-august for that and so we're, we'll keep you posted on that and work on that as well. Uh, next steps last week. Next steps. We had 30 people in the summer for next steps, and I want to welcome all of those who said, "Hey, we want First Christian Church of Venice to be uh, our church family," and so welcome them. That was awesome. I also just wanted to say this. Uh, we're just trying this out. If you're at home, you know, we want you to go ahead and prepare for your communion time that we'll have a little bit later in the service. Grab some bread and some juice and be able to participate with us. If you're here and didn't know, we actually take communion every Sunday, and we just want to make sure that, you know, hey, if you're a believer in Jesus, we want you to join with us. You're welcome to join with us, and if you missed somehow, if you missed your communion cup, would you just kind of hold your hand if you want to participate with us? If you just, if you missed, we want to make sure that everybody has that opportunity. We've got one over here. Oh, never mind. Don't have one over here. Okay, great. No one? Okay, just wanted to let you know about that. Hey, would you stand with me? And let's, uh, let's pray. And we're going to ask God just to have his way with us today. All right? That's a dangerous prayer. <laughs> Father, we do pray right now that you would have your way with us. That you would remove the distractions and the things of this world. And for this hour, just for this hour right now, God, would we lean into you? Would we lean into your Holy Spirit? The songs that we sing, may they not just be words on a screen, but they would, they would flow outwardly from our heart to you for our love for you. Father, during our time of communion, may we focus on the cross. May we focus on the gospel message of the cross and how it's radically changed our life and we're continuing to ask you to change our lives. And so even as we're in this message series, God, would you change us today? Would we leave here different from then when we came in? Would you draw us closer to you? And that's our prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, find somebody that you've never met before. Introduce yourself. Tell them your name, maybe your social security number, whatever. <laughs> Searching for answers, far and wide, but I. 
Good morning, church. My name is Paul Tucker, and I'm going to be leading us this morning in the communion. And as we come together this morning to remember the Lord's death, his resurrection, and the fact that he's coming again through the support of participating in the Lord's Supper. We invite you who are, know Christ as your personal Savior to join us. And for those watching on TV, if you get your elements prepared to be a part of the service. I would like, I would like for each of us to set aside, at least for a few moments, the cares and distractions that are surrounding us today. And there are many, right? We, this week, do I, do I have a hip replacement or do I get a tank of gas? Uh, <laughs> it's a tough decision. Well, I know it's a tall order, but in doing so, it allows us to focus our thoughts on honoring our Lord and respecting the sacrifice he made for us. We're reminded by Paul in Philippians 2 what Christ did in order to provide salvation for us. He, being the perfect one, left heaven to dwell among us. He is the creator of all. He is the sustainer of all. He is the ruler of all. And yet he came to live among us. He, being sinless, pure, and all good, died for us. And as it says in Philippians 2, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Can you imagine what was going through his mind as he met with his disciples for that one last time? as they gathered in that upper room. You see, he knew what was going to come. He knew what was going to happen. He knew this time was coming even before the creation of the world. He knew of the betrayal, the arrest, the beating, the mock trial, the pain, the suffering, the loneliness of the crucifixion, his death. He knew all of it, yet he chose to follow the path set before him. In Isaiah 53, we read of the suffering he experienced on the cross. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hid their faces, he was despised. And we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. And he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Jesus took the bread and blessed it and said, take, eat. This is my body, 
which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In taking up the cup, Jesus spoke of the new covenant. And this new covenant is a promise that God makes with mankind that he will forgive our sins and restore communion with those whose hearts believe in his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. And his death on the cross is the basis of the promise. So then Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we can't even begin to fathom the pain and the suffering and the anguish that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, experienced as he walked through those final hours and his time on the cross. But we know it was a great price. And we know that because of your love, you offered your son for that sacrifice to be a payment for our sins. And Lord, I pray that as a believer in Jesus Christ, as we look to you for guidance, for help, for strength, may we be that light that shines in a lost and dying world. May we be bold for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May we speak the truth in love, and may we honor you by what we do, by what we say. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Join with me as we do the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
So glad that you're here, and uh, we are in this series called My Big Fat Mouth, and I will tell you that, you know, people go, how, how did you come up with these topics all the time? And I go, well, this one's largely born out of my need for this. My big fat mouth gets me in trouble all the time. Last week, if this is your first time joining us, last week we kind of had an anchor passage for this or cornerstone piece for this series, and it comes from the book of James, and we're talking about our tongue. And so I said this, I said uh, from James chapter 3, when we put bits into the mouth of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. And so we did this thing last week where we had a little catchphrase. We said, don't spit the bit. If you didn't watch the message, go back. Just out of curiosity, how many of you guys said that this week? Don't spit the bit. Don't spit the bit. Yeah. So like who preaches a message like that on a Sunday and it has the worst golf round on a Monday. <laughs> and the whole day I'm going, don't spit the bit, don't spit the bit, don't spit the bit, because we had all these guys around us. Anyway, so that's what Paul, I mean, uh, uh, James is saying here. He says, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. So he's making this uh, metaphor here. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body. But, and we like to focus on big butts sometimes here, and this is a big butt. <laughs> Sounds weird. <laughs> but it makes great boasts. It might be a small part of our body, but it has a tremendous impact on our lives and the lives of others. Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. All right, here we go. Some fun here. Uh, how many of you can roll your tongue? Let's just try it right now. Roll your tongue mm, like this. Mm. Roll your tongue. Those of you online, if you just tuned in, you might think we're a little strange here. This, go ahead, try it. This is the first. This will be maybe the only time the whole church gets to stick their tongue out at me. All right, roll your tongue. How many of you can't roll your tongue? How many? Yeah, that's a good number of you can't roll your tongue. You know. So um, what we're trying to do in this series is trying to tame our tongue and trying to train our tongue and trying to tame it so that we can control ourselves a little bit more. When I was thinking about the communion thought today, Paul Tucker preached the gospel message in about three minutes. It was absolutely amazing. 
What we want to do is we want to take, now that we've kind of heard this gospel, now we've accepted Jesus, we want to start trying to become more like him. And so we want our tongue to be used for positive things and building up and not something negative. Because the reality is this same small part of our mouth that's so powerful, we use it to praise God with, but we also use it uh, for destruction. And it can be used for destroying others. Now, we talk a lot about, I talk a lot about this, uh, the, the greatest commandment in the world. When the Pharisees came to Jesus, they asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment in the world of all of Scripture? And there were 613 Jewish laws, so it was no easy task. And they were trying to trap Jesus into this. And Jesus responded to them, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and all of your mind. And they accepted that. That was fine. That was true. And it's right. And that's who we're supposed to be, right? And then, and then he says something that's profoundly mysterious. And he says, but there's another one that's equal to it. And I think to myself, like the Pharisees, what could possibly be equal to loving the Lord our God, the supreme being who created this universe and created us, what could possibly be equal to to worshiping and loving him with all of our heart and our, all of our mind and all of our soul. And he says, Jesus says, to love your neighbor then as yourself. And the whole of the gospel comes down to this. Love God. Love people. It's really that simple. Challenging, yes, but simple. The simplicity of it, of the entire gospel, comes down to loving God completely with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and loving our neighbors, loving others like we love God. And so Paul condenses this when he's talking to the church in Galatia. So the Apostle Paul is a church planner. He goes out and he starts all these different churches. We're going to look at what he says to the church in Galatia. We're going to look at what he says to the church in Ephesus. Because the church, honestly, the church is struggling with this issue. And that's why Paul talks a lot about this throughout Scripture. And it's why we need to talk about it as well. So Paul says in Galatians, uh, chapter 5, verse 14 says, For the whole law, and he sort of condenses what Jesus says, for the whole law can be summed up in this one command. He says, Love your neighbor as yourself. But, and there we are with those big butts again, but if you are always biting and devouring one another, apparently that's what they were doing in their church, and sometimes Christians are the worst about it, right? I mean, the, we know the world does that, but sometimes the church people get involved in that too. But if they're biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. And words can cause so much damage in our life. You think back, and you probably don't have to go too far back in the memory banks of words that were said to you that were so hurtful, so harmful. Now, as guys, I don't know if you girls do this or not, but us guys... When we get together sometimes, we, we kind of share this like badge of honor with the physical injuries that we've had. You know, we sort of do that. Like, you know, we'll get a few guys around there going, yeah, I got this one here right when I was using the head trimmers around the house, you know. The other guy goes, oh, yeah, I got that. I got one right here where I fell off the roof, broke my femur bone, you know. And then you got another guy who goes, oh, yeah, let me show you this. I got a knife wound from Nam back in 62 or whatever, you know. And then, you know, you always have the one-upper. You always have the one-upper guy that goes, well, let me show you this. You guys think that's bad. Let me show you this. And they're like, you know, you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, you win. You win, you know. <laughs> and so guys kind of tend to, they, they want to share their physical wounds as, as sort of a badge of honor. But what we don't do, we tend to hold tight. We tend to hold tight when it comes to emotional scars or emotional wounds. We don't often share those and the words that wounded us or hurt us. And so we keep those, and we just keep those tucked up inside. I think a lot of us do that. I was thinking about this, and I thought, well, let me just share. I'll just get on the couch here for a second, you know, and uh, share a little bit about some of the wounds that I've had. 32 years in ministry, you're going to have some wounds. These are a couple that came to my mind right off the bat. And so years, years and years ago, I was asked to take over and lead a church that was going through, it was in a really sharp state of decline. 
had had some deep failures in leadership. And so I was asked to take over this church to be the senior pastor to see if I could, you know, help this church come through that. And so I remember trying to process that. And I was sitting down with another pastor one time and he looked at me and he said, you don't, you're not seriously considered doing this, are you? You're not seriously, because you, you can't preach your way out of a wet paper bag. Those are the words he said. And I almost didn't do this because of those words that he said. I almost didn't ever preach because of the words. But you know what? Every time, every time, I'm not, I'm not saying this to get sympathy from you, but every time that I have an off Sunday or every time that I have a Sunday where the message doesn't connect in a way that I think it should or the way that I had it planned in my mind, you know, when I get home and I'm sitting on the processing the day, I'm going, who do you think you are? You know, what are you doing? You can't preach God's word. You can't preach your way out of a wet paper bag. Because words can harm us. Words can, can destroy us. It can set us off in paths of our lives that God doesn't want us to go on. Words are so powerful. This is another one. This is kind of funny, all right? This one's kind of funny to me. Still painful a little bit, but kind of funny. I remember a new guy. He was a new guy, a guest, a new guy that came to our church. I didn't even know who he was. He came up to me after I had just finished a teaching, and he said, Hey, uh, hey guy, well, you know, you know it, it, when the guy comes up to you that you don't know and says, Hey, guy, you pretty much know something bad's going to happen after that because he didn't even know my name or even uh, come to respect me or anything in that. He said, <clears throat> You know, if you ever take some speech classes and fix your speech problem... I might actually come to your church. I was like, you know, I was like, it took me completely off guard. I was like, how's that? What? What? He said, you have a serious speech problem. Now, I know that I'm from Kentucky, and, and I know that sometimes my language can mystify those of you who are from New York and New Jersey. I get that, you know. But I never really thought that I had a speech problem, so I asked him, I said, yeah, can you, can you give me an example? And he said, sure, sure, here's one. When you say words like stay or you, you say stay, you know, or if you say that you're picking up sticks, you say shtick. And you always put an H where there should be no H after an S. And so he's drinking his coffee and he has one of those little things to mix the sugar with. And he says, for instance, he goes, well, what am I doing right now? And I said, you're stirring your coffee with a shtick, you schmuck. You know? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't really call him a schmuck. Not out loud, anyway. By the way, I looked up what schmuck is just to make sure that I could say that in church, and it's, it's, completely, it's completely legal. <laughs> but I walked away from that guy, and I go, man, that guy stinks. <laughs> <You know? laughs> You know, but it's a little bit funny, but at the same time, uh, that was about 10 years ago. And when I was thinking about this message, I just kind of wanted to go down memory lane. What are some of the hurtful words? And that came to my mind. And it still comes to my mind when I say words like stick or stir or still or stay, you know, I'm working on it. Now, he may have helped me a little bit with that. Maybe I did have that as a problem, but he sure went about it the wrong way, right? And words can cause lasting damage and things that are embedded in our brains for the things that have been said about us. And for those of you who've been wounded by words, I know and I know and I know that you can find forgiveness and freedom in that. Now that one was kind of funny to me. But if I'm, if I'm real honest um, with you in my own life, it's pretty easy to fall into that trap myself. And it's pretty easy for me to be critical of others and say damaging words. I'll go ahead and confess to you one of my most regretful, this is in the top three probably, of most regretful criticisms or fault finding or just hurtful words that I've said. I was an adolescent. I was an adolescent. And I've told you before that I was adopted. I was adopted into the most amazing Christ-centered, uh, loving, just the healthiest, fun, fun families. I mean, it was so great growing up in my family. But one day, in anger at 
probably a disciplinary action that I deserved. I was there when my mom was disciplining me, and I told her, I said, I wish you had never adopted me. Can you believe that? Yeah. That was one of the most hurtful, critical, damaging words that I could have said to my mom. Now, I've, I've cried over that in my life. I've lamented over that. I've asked for forgiveness, and I know God's forgiven me. My mom's forgiven me. But that was so destructive, so destructive. Now, that was a doozy. That one was a doozy. I'm not proud of that. And I hope that in my life I've matured enough to never, ever, ever say anything that painful or that hurtful for the rest of my life. But even our slightest criticisms can stay with us. Both when we say them, when we verbalize them to others, and when they've been verbalized or said something to us. And they can be as simple as, you know, how can you wear that dress? That's the most ridiculous dress I've ever seen. Or those are ugly shoes. Or what in the world did you do with your hair? I had another one one time. I had another one one time. I, I, uh, I just found out that I was going bald. And, and I looked at myself on video one day. And I'm like, I'm bald. And it was like the first time I realized that I was bald. And I was trying to be one of those guys that, that grew the hair out, you know. And so I finally decided to shave it off. Because if you just grow, for me, if I just grow out the side, I look, if I just grow out the side where I've got hair, I look like a, an old, uh, scary bozo the clown. And so I decided to shave it off. And I walked into church one day, and this lady, she looked at me, and she goes, oh, you're going for the cancer look. <laughs> can you imagine? Just can you imagine? Sometimes we just don't, you just don't think, you know, because we can say these words that just stick with us. They stick with us. By the way, It's uh, really easy to be critical of parents of toddlers until you have a toddler. I remember thinking before we had kids, I remember thinking, when we have kids and when our kids are that age, they are not going to act that way. I'm going to discipline them and they are not going to act that way in the grocery store. You know, by the time you're on your second toddler and you're in the grocery store, whatever you say, here, have this candy, take this toy, here, have this balloon, whatever it takes to get you to shut up, you know? <laughs> it's like, and so for those of you who don't have kids, be very careful about your criticism of other parents. But when we're critical of others, it is cutting and it is damaging. Proverbs is known as a book of wisdom. And here's what Proverbs says. Some people make cutting remarks. When I think of this, when I think of this scripture and the way it says this, I'm thinking of cutting remarks that leave lasting scars. He says, some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, I can easily fall into the trap of criticizing others. But that's not who I want to be. That's not who I want to be. And if I'm a betting person, I bet that's for you too. You don't want to be that way either. So we want to talk today about becoming a person who brings hope to others' lives rather than cutting them, who brings healing rather than destroying them, who brings encouragement rather than discouragement in our lives. So let's take a look at the Scripture, another Scripture today, and see how we can be a people that brings hope and healing and encouragement to others. A couple rules here, a couple rules. Uh, This message is titled, My Big Fat Mouth. It's not titled, Your Big Fat Mouth. And so what I would encourage you to do is don't weaponize this message to use against your spouse or your child or whoever's sitting next to you. Don't elbow the person sitting next to me this is a message, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's about you for you, it's about me for me. No side-eyeing glances here unless you're going to pull out a mirror and look at yourself, all right? So we need to work on this for our own mouths, no, none of this, all right? Another comment before we go further is that I, I'm not talking about constructive criticism done out of love. Constructive criticism done out of love is perfectly within what we want in our lives. But the key thought there is it's done out of love. I love and I desire and I want constructive help on ways to get better, to get better as a human. I want to know. I want to learn. But it's got to be done gently with mercy, with grace, and with love and kindness. And, you know, I ask for feedback 
all the time on ways that I can communicate better. How can I say something in a way that will help every one of us move forward in our faith? I want to know ways to be a better husband, to be a better dad, to be a better son, to be a better pastor. And so I try and sponge. I try to sponge on those things from people who I trust and love who can help me be better. So constructive criticism done in love is a good thing. And today we want to learn the virtue of building each other up in love and minimizing or ridding ourselves of a critical um, fault-finding heart and spirit in our lives. So I want to first start with this statement here. I want you to think about this. This is a definition of adolescence. Adolescence is the luxury of criticism without responsibility. I mean, think about that. It's, it, it's kind of deep there, but adolescence is the luxury of criticism without responsibility. I'll give you a little secret. I have a simple three-measure system for determining if someone would be a good leader in the church. I, ask, I, I, I judge them based on three categories in their life. I say, are they babies? Are they brand new to the faith? Are they, are they just now, you know, drinking milk? Are they just now at the point where they're learning what it means to be a follower of Christ? Are they brand new in their faith? Are they babies? And then at some point you move from a baby and you move into adolescence. Just think about your own life or your kids' lives. That in Growing up, they moved to adolescence. And what are some of the characteristics of adolescence? Not being negative to those of you who are adolescents, but those are the Christians who always tend to know everything. They always tend to know better they won't listen to wisdom, and they think that they're mature, but in reality, they have sophomoritis. You know what sophomoritis is. Those of you who have kids, and those of you who are, should know what sophomoritis is. It's this age category that kind of comes in the moment that you become a sophomore. I don't know why. It doesn't happen at freshman, and you sort of grow out of it in junior and senior, but when you're a sophomore... You develop, sophomore college specifically, you develop this sophomoritis where you think you know better than your parents, you know better than your dad, you can't, t nobody can tell you anything, you know how to do everything great, you know. You've seen this, you've heard this, the story where the guy, you know, grows up and his dad is really smart and he's the hero when he's five and six and then his dad starts getting dumber and then he gets about 16, 17, his dad's just a complete idiot and then somewhere around 25 when the human brain starts to fully develop, you go, man, my dad's so smart, you know, we've seen, we've seen that. And so then they develop and that's what leads into the third category is the mature Christian, the mature Christian. But the reality is the, that many long-time Christians, so it's not an age thing for our faith, but many long-time Christians have actually never moved out of adolescence in their life, and they have stayed in adolescence, and they've never moved to a, a maturity in Christ, and they're just kind of stuck in this adolescent mindset. And here's how you can judge. Here's how you can, how you can determine where you're at. How critical you are of others, how judgmental you are of others is a key examination to diagnose whether you are stuck as an adolescent Christian or whether you've been able to move to maturity in your faith. And if your criticism doesn't offer a solution and it's not done in great love and honor and respect and gentleness and kindness, then it is not constructive. And that is one big sign of someone who is stuck in adolescent Christianity. And we want to grow to fullness. Here's what the Apostle Paul says to the church in Ephesus. Again, he's talking to these different churches because they're all struggling with this. They're all struggling with it. And he says this to the church in Ephesus. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up. For building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. All right, so there's um, two kinds of people in the world. How, how many of you guys, how many of you guys watch, uh, have seen What About Bob, the movie What About Bob? Yeah. I'm going to quote this for you. This is probably going to fall flat, but um, in one scene, Richard Dreyfuss tells Bill Murray, he, 
he says, you know, ask him a question, and Bill Murray goes, there's only two kinds of people in the world, those who like Neil Diamond and those who don't. <laughs> anyway, so besides that, there are only two kinds of people in the world, those who are fault finders and those who are hope givers. Those who are fault finders, those who are hope givers. Let's talk about fault finders for a second. If you're a fault finder, you are a lot like the Pharisees. You're a lot like the religious leaders in the Bible because that is exactly what the Pharisees did. But not only that, and this is going to seem a lot more harsh, but you're not only like the Pharisees, you're actually taking on one of the attributes of the devil himself. If you're a critical fault finder, you be the devil. You the devil. You the devil. It's a different movie, you guys. Come on. Because one of the, uh, what is that? Who is that movie? Waterboy, Waterboy, Waterboy. You the devil. Because one of the names, here's the thing, one of the names of the devil is deceiver. It says he's the devourer. He's the prince of darkness, he's described as. He's described as the father of lies, and he's also called the accuser. He's the accuser. He accuses the people of God even day in and day out. What does he do? He finds fault because he's a fault finder. And that's what the Pharisees do, and that's what the devil does. And the truth is, I mean, if we're just honest with ourselves, that's what we do sometimes. We do. We find faults. We accuse. Why do we do it? Why do we do it? Well, I think a large reason is because we're full of pride. We're filled with pride in, in our lives. Not the good kind of pride. Not our, grandparent, not our grandkids kind of pride, you know. We think we know what's best. We're also insecure and we criticize sometimes, we criticize others and we find faults in others that are actually weaknesses in our own life. And so we try to bring out their weaknesses to just kind of bring ourselves up over top of them. But, but when we have a critical fault-finding spirit, when somebody's overly critical, when somebody comes up to me and they're just like overly critical over something, I think about Shakespeare. I think about, oh, thou doth protest too much. And when they're doing that, I'm kind of like, I think you're hiding something. I think you've got something going on in your life for thou doth protest too much, you know? And so those are some of the reasons why we do that, why we fault find. There's other reasons too, but for the sake of time, I won't go into that. Now, those of you who are married, it's easy to drift into fault finding in, with our spouses, isn't it? I mean, this could, be, this could be an unhealthy argument for you and your spouse. You know, well, I don't like the way you cook. You know, well, I don't like the way you squeeze the toothpaste. You know, well, I don't like the way you do your hair. Well, I don't like the way you chew. Well, I don't like the way you breathe, you know. And so this thing can just go on and on and on. Now, this, uh, the list could just go on and on. But before I read this passage of Scripture, I need to have every man looking in the room to me right here. Just look, look. Keep your eyes on me. All right? It's really important. Keep your eyes. Don't look at your spouse. This thing could go sideways real easy, okay? <laughs> Keep your eyes right focused on me. Put your feet square on the floor. Put your hands on your lap and elbows tucked in. Look at me. Look at me. Do not, look, do not break eye contact with me. Here's what Proverbs 21 says. It's better to live alone in the desert than with a quarrelsome, complaining wife. All right? Again, stay focused. Stay focused. Now, you may say, you may say well, what about the men? What about the men, you know, right? <laughs> well, have no fear. I found this obscure passage about men that applies to us guys, all right? Here we go. It says, it's better to have bamboo shoots jammed in your fingernails than to live with a man who is hypercritical. <laughs> it's, it's found in the book of Hesitations, <laughs> chapter 1, verse 1. For those of you who are new to the Bible, don't go try looking for that passage of Scripture. I just made that up. However, it, it remains true for all of us, right? Men and women together, it remains true. But think about the areas in your life where you are critical. Think about that 
in your life. Maybe it's in your workplace, you know. I don't like the way she runs the meetings, you know. I don't like what they post on Facebook. Well, this is the stupidest place I've ever worked before. I don't like the way he talks so much. I don't like how loud she is, you know. And that list can just go on and on and on. And another reason, another reason why we are fault finders is we don't understand sometimes. We don't see the full picture. We don't have all the information that we need in order to make constructive criticism in order to help a person change in an area of their lives. And that's where it leads us to the second type of person, and that is the hope giver. The hope giver. And that's who we want to become. That's who we want to be. Now, I may have a critical heart at times, and if I'm not careful, I can drop into a fault finder mode. But who I want to be and who I'm striving to be, and I think this is probably for you too, is we want to be hope givers. The Apostle Paul says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Why? He says, so that you may overflow, so that you may be overflowing with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Paul was a chief hope giver. Anytime he would speak or anytime he would write, he would not tear people down. He built them up. He he didn't let any unwholesome talk come out of his mouth, but only that which was helpful for building each other up and pouring into people's lives. He was a supreme hope giver. In fact, if you read some of his writings, I'm just going to pick out some things in Romans chapter 8, and I want you to listen to the words that Paul said, and, and, uh, and I just picked out some highlights here, but it really gives me hope when I see this. He says, Now therefore, there is no condemnation for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. He said, The Holy Spirit, He will help you in your weaknesses, in the areas that you're weak. He said, Jesus is right now making intercession at the right hand of God, the Father, on your behalf right now. In other words, Jesus is praying to God right now for you, on behalf of you. That's just, that's just amazing. It gives me so much hope. He said that you are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. That gives me hope. He said, neither life nor death, neither demons nor angels nor powers of the present or the future, neither height nor depth, neither anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that gives me hope. Do you want to be a fault finder, a hypercritical, or do you want to be a hope giver? The Pharisees, they were fault finders. The devil's a fault finder, but Jesus is full of hope. And I love the different metaphors of Jesus. It says, he's the bread of life, right? He's the living water. He's the good shepherd. He's the door. He's the living vine. He's the, he's the gate. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the alpha and omega. He's the beginning and the end, among many others. But let me tell you what else he is. In 1 Timothy, Jesus is called our hope. Jesus himself is called our hope. In Titus, Jesus is called the blessed hope. In 1 Peter, Jesus is called the living hope. Jesus is our hope. Now, whenever someone would sin, whenever someone would sin, the Pharisees would point out the sin and accuse them of their sin. But Jesus would come. He would still point out the sin because sin is sin, right? And don't confuse this with the grace of Jesus with a license to sin. Sin is still sin. But the difference is, is that Jesus still pointed out the sin, but he offered hope to break the bondage of the sin. So even in the problems, Jesus addresses the problem and then still gives hope to break through that bondage. For instance, there was a woman who was caught in adultery And what did the Pharisees do? They drug this woman out of their house and brought her and threw her down in front of the church leaders. That's what it was. And they said this woman uh, was caught in the act of adultery. And they look at Jesus and they say, what do you think that we should do? Again, they were trying to trap him. And so Jesus kneels down on the sand And he's going to address the Pharisees who are always just the accuser, never offering the solutions. 
And Jesus kneels down and he begins to write in the sand. We don't really know what he wrote, but I like to think that Jesus was writing the sins of the Pharisees on the ground in the sand. And then he said, the first one who's never sinned cast the first stone. And I love what the Bible says. It says the old men left first. They were the first ones to drift away and then the younger men, right? Because why? Well, because... I don't know about you, but I've had a lot of sin in my life. And the older I get, the more I realize I need Jesus. The more I realize I need his grace. And then Jesus doesn't just leave her where she is. He still addresses the problem, but he doesn't leave her broken and full of shame. But he says to the woman, where are your fault finders? Where are your accusers? And she looks up and she says, they're gone. And he says, well... Uh, where are those who tried to condemn you? She looks up and she says, they're gone. And so Jesus says, then I, uh, neither do I condemn you. But he doesn't leave her there. He says, but now I want you to break the pattern of what is going on with relationships in your life like this. Stop being trapped in unhealthy relationships. He said, now go on your way and sin no more. Because Jesus is our hope giver. We can find hope in Jesus. We can find forgiveness. We can find healing. We can find the breaking of the bondage of the sins in our life. And Jesus offered her hope. What do you want to be? Do you want to be a fault finder? That's what the Pharisees were. Or do you want to be a hope giver? He, he covers your sin, too, in your life. But he doesn't want us to stay in our sin. And just because he forgives us and offers us hope and a way out, if we remain in our sin, there still can be consequences in our life. Let's put this into a real life, real world application. Let's say your son commits a grievance against you. If you're hypercritical or you're a fault finder, you call them names, you diminish them, you tear them down, and you accuse, and all those things lead to bitterness and division and hurt feelings through critical fault-finding spirit. That's what happens when you're a fault finder. However, if you're a hope giver, you love them through their sin. You love them through their problem, and you help offer a solution to be able to walk away and break free from the bondage that they have in their lives. My question to you is this. What are the areas in your life, and I'm wrapping up with this, but what are the areas in your life where you need to eliminate a critical spirit? What are the areas? Is it with your spouse? And men, let me just say, your spouse, that's, the bri- that's your bride. I mean, we're called to love, even be willing to lay our lives down for our bride. We can't be critical and fault-finding and tearing down our brides. Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's your boss. Maybe it's me. I don't know. Maybe it's the church. You know, I'm very, very careful. I'm very careful when I criticize. I don't ever criticize churches. I mean, like, I'm critical of that. I'm critical. I'm critical of that. I am very careful of being critical of that. Because I think about this. That's Jesus' bride. The church is the bride of Jesus. Like, you don't want to talk about the bride of Jesus. Like, I can talk about my wife, but you can't talk about my wife, right? You know that? Like, so, so, man, be really careful. What are the areas in your life where you are, need to eliminate criticism? Ask God to give you the heart of Jesus for others. All right, I'm going to wrap up, but here's what I want to say is that I don't want to leave us without an application. So what do we do? What are some tools that we can have to help us get better in this. I don't want to just present the problem without a solution, right? I want us to have a little bit of a solution. This is what I do. I don't know if it's uh, it's not perfect. I don't have it all down yet. But this has helped me, and I've been putting this into place, I think, since about 2016, somewhere about six years ago. I uh, had someone share this with me, and I'll share it with you. And so whenever, before I respond to a criticism... Or before I go to someone with hopefully constructive criticism, I do these three things. And I've shared this with you before in some other applications, but it works for a lot of things. I think about STP. I think about oil. STP. Stop, think, and pray. 
Stop, think, and pray. Now, 99 times out of 100, I just made that statistic up, but I think it's probably close to true. 90 times out of 100, 99 times out of 100, the reason that I am fault-finding and critical is because I'm caught off guard or I'm angry at something and somebody has caught me into a point where I'm like, rah, and I respond out of anger. But these days, what I'm trying to do, and I've failed, I've probably even failed with some of you on this, but what I'm trying to do is go, all right, stop. Before I say anything to this person, before I respond in any way to this person, I need to stop. I I need to stop right where I'm at. And sometimes that might mean I need to process this a little bit. Give me a day or two. The harder that it is, the more time you need, right? I need to process this. I need to get my emotions around this. I need to think about this. That leads us to the next thing. Think. Think. Before you're going, even in a constructive criticism manner to help someone in your family or around you or whatever... Think. And then inside of think, there are three questions, and they're very simple. Number one is, is what I'm about to say to this person, is it true? Is it true? Now, just because something's true doesn't mean that we should say it. Just because something's true. If your son or daughter can't sing, that might be true don't need to go say that to them you know you don't you need to smile and kind of try to smile through it if they can't sing you know just you don't need to say it that goes to the second one is what i'm is this true if it's not true then it's just a no i don't need to say it it's not true it's out the second thing is is this necessary for me to say if I share this information, am I going to in some way be able to help them? Am I going to be able to build them up? Am I going to be able to encourage them? Am I going to be able to help them on in their Christian walk and in their Christian life and becoming more like Jesus? Is what I'm about to say helpful? Is it necessary? So, is it true? Is it necessary? And then the third thing in that is, uh, is what I'm about to say, can I say that with kindness and love? If I can't say, if I'm still too mad and I can't say it with kindness and gentleness and love, then don't say it. But is it true? Is it necessary? And can I say it kindly and gently? And then the third thing is for us is pray. Stop, think, think about those three things, and then pray. The harder the conversation, the more time, the more time you need to pray about it. The more time you need to stop, the more not time you need away. And so that's a good reminder. It's not perfect. But it kind of helps me. The hard part of that is when you're in the moment and you're like, going, okay, I'm going to stop. I'm going to think. I'm going to pray. That's the hard part, right? That's the great challenge. We've got the tools on it. Now we just need to control ourselves a little bit. And when we do that, we'll be able to build up others better. All right. I went a little long today. But let's stand together. And uh, if you would like to be prayed with at the end of the service, we'll be over here to your left. If you want to talk about next steps and uh, i'd love to meet you and i'll be back in the in the back there on, on your way out we still got another song we're going to worship with but let me pray over you father i just pray um, that you would help us as we learn to control as we learn to tame and train uh, this small part of our body that makes such a huge impact in the lives of others and i pray that we will be a people who are hope givers that will encourage and love and equip and build others up for our church. In Jesus' name, amen.